everybody. Good to see everybody. Good to see everybody. I'll uh, go over a couple things with you before we jump into our Bibles today. Hey, guess what? We changed the name of the church. We didn't just come in and see those banners up like it wasn't the, it wasn't the house uh, mouse that put them up. We did it. Changed the name of the church. And I know some of you were here last night, but some of you were not. So I just wanted to tell you what was going on, you know. Um, it was about three years ago that we started, we put this billboard up on the highway, and it was talking about uh, the fact that Jesus loved everybody, and no matter what they had done, no matter who they were, there was no section of our culture that was not accepted by Jesus. And he hung out with a bunch of riffraff, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a riffraff, and he loves me, and so uh, we put that billboard up, and it was cool. And so it started really SNL Church, and it's been a great three years. You know, I think that that billboard and, and our name, SNL Church, was was, was done on purpose. It was, it was for this. It was for you guys. It was to just to form a family. And so now we've got this family, and it's a strong family. We all love each other. We hang out, and we spend time together. We serve, and we love, and it's all good. It's been great. It really has. We've had a lot of people come to Christ, a lot of people baptized, a lot of, a lot of great things, a lot of lives changing, and that's been great. Uh, but just, it's just been this thing. You know, we just, it's time to, you know, you ever tell your kids, it's just time to grow up. You know, and it's time to grow up. And so we need to be this church. We've been talking about the last couple weeks about this revolution thing. It started a lot longer ago. It wasn't just a couple weeks ago. We did talk a couple weeks ago in the last few about a revolution. Just kind of looking at everything that's going on and saying it's just not enough. And it starts with the church. It starts with us. And we can't worry about what other churches do, what other people do right now. It starts here in our house. And so this name really has a lot of meaning to it. It's not just a cool name. It's not just a cool logo. There's really a lot of meaning to it. We'll go over it for the next month or so. Well, all the, it's like an onion. If you just peel it back, there's so much to it. It's a deep word. But basically, it's this. It's just a call. It's a call to us to rise higher. It's a, it's a symbol to the rest of the world that this church right here is maybe not a typical church. Maybe we're the church that, that just looks at everything and goes, you know what? No, nah, that's just not going to fly. Broken systems, broken world. We want to live uh, by the Word of God. We have literally open our Bibles, read what it says, do what it says. We're different people. And people, you know, if you're a Christian, people should notice. And you should be distinctly different than someone who's not a Christian. I know I fail on that often, but I want to do better. I want to do better. Uh, and so we did. We changed our name. And, and it has, like I said, it has a lot of meaning. And we'll go over it over the next uh, couple of weeks to a month. Uh, but over the next few weeks, you'll see things change. You know, the sign up front will come down. We'll put up a new sign. You see these banners in here. Our website has changed. Our Facebook has changed. Our YouTube channel has changed. Our apps have changed. Uh, if you want to connect to those things, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get rid of scumbagchurch.com. Just erase that from your memory. And remember this, uh, this address. And you can write it down. You can put it into your smartphone right now if you want just to check out what we've done. But it is uh, revolutionchurch.cc. Now, when you go there, you will see that there are four opportunities for people and for us to connect. Okay, there's, there's one that just leads them right to our Facebook page. There's another that leads right to our YouTube channel. There's another that leads right to the download of an Android app. And then there's the fourth, which is the download of the Apple app to your device, whether it's a phone or whether it's an iPad. So any way that someone wants to connect with this church or for us to connect with them, it's right there on that very, very simple website. So it is, again, revolutionchurch.cc. Now, I want to let you know that after we get done in here, that we play our last song and everyone kind of hangs out. That's awesome. If you'd like, we have some t-shirts. Mark is modeling one for us tonight and he is ready for that, huh? Now, here's the thing, you won't all look that good, but if you want to try, there are t-shirts in the back, and we have Joey. Joey's going to be the muscle back there, so don't try to steal one, okay? Here's the deal with the t-shirts. Nothing in this life is free except salvation, amen? Okay, so um, even though Jesus gives you a freebie, we don't. We're a little bit different. T-shirts are seven bucks, okay? So here's, here's what we want to do. Because we're a loving church, and we want to help each other out, remember that whole Acts 2, 42 through 47, that if there's anyone in need, the rest of us would kind of kick in? Okay, so here it is. There's seven bucks, but if you can, if you can, there's no T, if you can, pay ten, and if you can't, pay five. Is that cool? Let the, let the rich folks help the poor folks. You know what I'm saying? So that's what we're going to do. Now, if you don't see your size, Joey needs, believe it or not, he needs a, a, a quadruple X. Now, you wouldn't be able to tell that because he is a sexy thing. 
But you need, and we don't have any shirts that big on this run, but next week, uh, we'll take whatever is gathered here tonight, and we'll go ahead and get some more t-shirts made. We'll get a nice 4X in pink for Joey. Okay, so do that. Also back there, you're going to see some uh, yard signs that you can, if you love your church and you want to, you're not that person that's going to like knock on the door and share the gospel to everybody. I understand that everyone's a big mouth, but you can put a sign on your yard, and, and maybe they'd want to ask you a question as to about your church, about your Jesus, about your Bible, and it's a good way to play bait. So if you want a yard sign, you can grab one. Those don't, don't cost anything. There's a bunch of them back there, too. We'll make more, but grab them. Um, also, but for everybody, there's a bunch of business cards back there. So you can put some in your wallet, your purse, whatever, and you can hand them out. And just invite people to church. If Jesus saved you, and you're part of a community, and, and, you, and you've benefited from it, just imagine all those people that you know that would benefit the same way, that would love to have good friends that love them, no matter who they were, what they've done, no judging, you know, all that stuff that we enjoy. Just think of all those people that would enjoy that, too. So make sure you give them out a card and invite them to your church, okay? Um, let me see. Uh, one last thing just before we jump into our, our uh, message for the night. Uh, the men that meet here on Tuesday nights, I just want to let you know that we are going to meet here this week. It's kind of going to be a recap, I think, is what we decided on, right, of the series that we started, this 33 series. Um, this first series, we're going to go, we did six weeks, we're going to go over those six weeks. For those that maybe missed a session or two, we'll give you the details of that class. And then we'll discuss the major topics of the class. We'll share what each other learned, our experiences there. And then we'll move on the following to uh, start a new series. But I want to let you know that um, there's tons of chili and fixings left over from last night. So what we're going to do is we're going to probably cook out on the grill again for the guys. Hot dogs and sausages, you know, really health food stuff. So we're going to do that again Tuesday night. So when you come, um, try to maybe get done. We usually start about 7, but see if you get here about 6.30 and we'll chow down before we, we do something. Okay? Is that cool? So guys, let's do that. All right. Um, that aside, let me turn my phone off. I was using it for announcements. Um, that was for you, Grayson. Um, let's do this. Um, you know, this, first of all, find in your Bible uh, Proverbs. That's, that's where we're going to spend the most of the night here tonight. Um, you can find it on your device, you can find it on your own Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there's plenty of them all around. Please pick one up. It's worthwhile. Put your eyes on the Word of God. Don't just listen to me. Listen to the Word of God, okay? So find yourself a Proverbs. We're going to be in other places, but that's like the majority. There's going to be a ton of Proverbs, which is good. Book of Wisdom. Gives you good advice on how to live, so that's a good place to hang out, right? Hey, what book was that? Proverbs, yeah. yeah. yeah um, this thing with revolution, like I said, we started a couple weeks ago, but really there's... Um, I guess it all, for, for me personally, it started way, way back, way back. I, you know, when I first became a Christian, I had, uh, and it's been building, I had this, like, this angst inside of me, this, this malaise, this, 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 kind of this overwhelming feeling all the time of just this discontent with the society that we live in, you know what I mean? It's just, like, things aggravate me when you see things that are going on, you're just like, man, this just isn't right, you know what I mean? And, and I guess... I guess uh, it was like, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, they really started to kick in. Uh, the name itself really started to brew up inside of me about six, eight months ago. So this is just the fleshing out of what's been going on for a long, long time. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels that. You, know, you just kind of look at how things are going. You just know something right, you know. And so that's kind of where we were in this whole revolution uh, series, just talking about things that aren't right and looking at it and saying, you know what, I just want to be a part of something different. I want to change this whole situation. I don't like the way things are going. Like, I have little things. Like, th does anyone agree with me? Like, chords? Chords bug me. Do, do chords drive me crazy. Does anyone remember the chord at your grandmother's house with the phone? The lawn, you know, with the spiral? Some of you got kids are like, what is that? You know? There was actually a chord attached to your phone. And there was something you put a quarter in. It's kind of crazy, right? But then they had the ones that were... They have like this, but then they gave you the the, um, the ones that were long range. You know the long springy spiral cords that would reach from here to the booth back there? And they'd get tangled up and the cat would be like, ah! you know, you, it's awful, right? So I remember, but I hate cords. I still hate cords to this day. We've got so many cords. I think that this is here just to spite me and drive me crazy. But uh, I hate cords. It's just one of those evidences of a fallen world, cords. They drive me insane. But I have this whole thing, like, I don't like the way things are going. And I, 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 if you're a stone cold atheist, you probably feel that same way too. So I'm like, something's just not right, you know what I mean? Something's just not right. But for the Christian, you know, you look at the Bible, the Bible says that, we, uh, that all creation is groaning. 
That's what the Bible tells. That's how God describes this thing that's inside of you. We're just kind of groaning that, that ever since the fall, things just weren't right. And, you know, people and animals and trees and mountains and lakes, they're all kind of sort of groaning like, oh, you know, if you ever get that feeling like, oh, just things aren't right, you know? And so what we do is we try to fix those things, you know? We try to fix those things. Uh, even if you're a stone-cold atheist, you, start, you throw stuff at the problem. You know what I mean? You throw stuff at the problem because you want it to get them. There's an idiot in every group, and they just want their hell bent on destroying themselves, right? They want that. They like ruining themselves. But generally speaking, the everyday person, they want to make things better in their own life. They're trying to improve upon their situation. And so you throw stuff at it to try to make it better. You guys, do you, do you agree? I mean, we all do it. Whether you're a Christian or not, you all do it. And so um, what we wanted to do is, as Christians, we wanted to look at the status quo and say, you know, we don't like this. Uh, like anybody else, we don't like this, but we want to find out, you know, what is it that we can do to make it better? Because I've tried different things. And so here's this old dusty book, and it's got this recipe in it, and it's worked for, like, billions of people. But we think we could do it in a better way, and so we try different things. But now what we want to do is, since we're Christians and we're the revolution church, we want to be revolutionaries. We want to look at the status quo and say, you know what, we need a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. I don't like it, but I don't know how to do it, so let's go to the one who created everything. We'll see what he has to say. And so that's what we've been doing the last couple of weeks. We talked about humility. We talked about valuing human life, whether it's in the belly or outside the belly, even ugly, ugly people. Not just ugly physically, but ugly down deep to the bone. You know what I'm talking about? Real ugly people. Um, we talked about that. Uh, I don't even remember the things. Oh, we talked about marriage. We talked about love. We talked about sex. Let me just tell you, let me, just, let me do this too. We had our discussion on Sunday night. Y'all should come. Um, and, and I think I was a little bit um, negligent in one area. And I would say this, that when, when two people have sex, in the scriptures it says that two became one. I understand that, okay? That's the union of two people. It's marriage. But let me just, let me remind you, okay, this is not some mindless animal instinct that just goes around humping anything that it wants, okay? That's not, we're not those people, we're not dogs. We're not rabbits, okay? We're people. We are, we're born with something special that other animals don't have. That's a brain that actually works beyond instinct, okay? There should be some level of commitment and covenant with the person that you sleep with. So it's not just like you stumble upon someone, oh, I had sex, I'm married. Okay, I understand that the physical brings the two together, but there should be something inside of you that says, this is it, I burn with lust, I like that one, I'm gonna have that one, I'm gonna stay. Can you all say stay? Stay, stay with that one. So there should be some conscious choice. Let's move on. So this week we're gonna talk about something different, okay? We're gonna talk about being different people. We're gonna talk about, um, it, and, and I don't do this all the time, but I'm going to label the message in case you want to go back to it another time. Let's talk about revolution reputation. Let's talk about what we're supposed to be like, okay? You can see number seven, kind of the cat out of the bag there. But that's the, this, is the, this is the issue we're going to talk about. It's a big one, okay? What does a, what does a Christian look like? If we're going to be revolutionaries. If we're going to be different, we're going to look at the landscape of our culture and say, you know what, we've got to attack this thing differently. This is, what the, this is the thing. What do people look, what do they say when they think of what do people say when they think of you personally? What do people say when they think of us corporately as a church? You know, most people don't look at churches with a very good um, uh, outlook on those people. You all admit this, right? I mean, you know this. People don't like church folks. People don't like church. Uh, we don't do a really good job of repping Jesus, but that's what we want to work on. We want to work on repping Jesus better, okay? So here's, our, and here's the thing. What will people think of us? It's important. We're not here to people, please, but if we're doing what God wants us to do and they think of us as Christians, as disciples of Christ, uh, image bearers of God, that would be healthy. That means we're doing our job. So this is what we're shooting for, okay? So what, this is what I want to do. I want to give you two verses uh, tonight to kind of ponder, all right? Um, let me take you to, keep your finger in progress, we'll be there a lot. Let me take you to Romans chapter 1. Go to Romans chapter 1. I want you to, and it's very, very simple, very, very brief. I want to, I want to read this to you. What will people think of you? Now, in this book here, in the book of Romans, is the Apostle Paul. And he's writing to who? Romans. Oh, you're so smart. Okay. <laughs> right bunch. Um, Romans chapter 1, Paul's writing to the, to the Romans. And, and this is what he says. He's an awesome pastor. And, and some, if you're going to be a pastor and you want to study Paul and you want to be like him, he's the man. Okay? This is what he says. He says in verse 8 of chapter 1, he says, Let me say first, 
Then I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. That's kind of cool. He's, he, so he's thanking God. He's, he's praying, right? He's telling God, thank you for these people. He's praying for these people, and that's something that we should do. That's something that I need to do better, okay? So that's convicted. But why? Why is he thanking God for these people? Here it is. Look after the comma. Because your faith in him, in God, in Jesus Christ, your faith in Jesus Christ is being talked about all over the world. That's a reputation. This wasn't just being, there's faith in God wasn't just being spoken of in their hometown or in their region. It was being spoken of across the known world. That's a really big area. People were talking about these folks all over the world about their faith in Jesus. Now, what does it mean to have faith in Jesus? Let me just offer this up to you. Trust in him, love of him, obedience to him, dependence upon him, service unto him, sharing of him and worship under and upward to him. That is faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, the book of Romans goes on to say it is through faith that the righteous person has life. So what it's telling us here is that, that many people, like every person on earth has a way to live. Everyone's going to live their certain way. But for the Christian, okay, for the Christian, their choice out of all the choices available to them is by faith, through faith, to be dependent upon him, to trust in him, to worship him exclusively. That is what it means to have faith. That is, way, that is the way the Christian is going to choose to live their life. Now, I can't speak of others, but I, and I can't speak of other churches, but for this church, this is what the call is to a revolution. It is a call upon each and every set of ears here tonight to live your life through faith in Jesus Christ. Utter dependence, utter trust, complete exclusive love and worship to him and him alone. You got that? That is what people will talk about. They won't, they want to, they're going to talk about something of you. Okay, what, we, what God's shooting for for us is that we would live a life of faith in Jesus Christ. So much so that people will talk about it. Okay? Now, I want to do this. I want to give you another verse. And you're going to see that they, they sort of war against each other. Okay, so same, same Bible, but you're going to see in this verse I'm going to give you that it sort of wars against the verse that I just shared. We're supposed to live by faith. Okay, that is a, that's the marching order that God has given you. Okay, but now in the book of Proverbs, we know that like Solomon is wise guy. He, not, not like a wise guy, you know what I'm saying, but like a very wise guy, like Yoda wise, not Godly wise. Okay, he, he points out something. A characteristic of the human heart. He's not, he's not teaching us something new or telling us how to live. He's teaching you how you are living. He's just pointing out something to you of yourself so you'll recognize it. And this is what he says. It's Proverbs 13, 12. Proverbs 13, 12. This is what it says. It says, hope deferred makes a heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. So let's just talk about like today's vernacular because no one, you look at me like I'm crazy, right? It says here, like, if you want something and you don't get it, you're bummed. Right? Would you all agree? That's what he's saying. If, if you want something and you ain't getting it, it's a bummer. But a dream fulfilled, like, so but if I do get it, that's rocking. So if I don't get it, bummer. If I do get it, awesome. You all agree that's what it's saying, right? That's, do you see how the two, do you see how that verse, it, it absolutely is at war at, with the first verse that we share in Romans 1.8. Romans 1.8 says that we're to have faith in this God who gives us some promises that he's going to take care of us, but there's this, there's this thing, it's the sinner's heart, and it's a battlefield, and in this heart, it's like, yeah, I, want, I have faith in him, I believe in him, I trust in him, but there's these things that I want. And, and, and because there's these things that I want, and, and I don't want to be patient for them, I got these lusts inside of me, and I got these, this impatience inside of me, so I, I need to go after this thing. And we don't want to wait. We don't want to trust. We don't want to be dependent upon Him. And so there's this thing inside of us that shows up in the sinner's heart, this war, between faith and trust and dependence upon this Christ 
who's made us some promises, and then there's this thing inside of us that wants something so bad, and so we want to act upon it to create this thing in our own lives. Let me share with you an example. It's right there in that same book of Romans. And he's talking to these people, and he explains exactly what I'm telling you in Paul's words. Let's read that together. It's a little bit long, but just bear with me. It's good. It's Bible. Okay? Um, let's go to Romans uh, chapter 1. Let's look at verse 18. Let's read this together. You're going to see this, this example uh, just fleshed out perfectly. Uh, let's read this here. Verse 18. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, or some translations will say suppress the truth in unrighteousness, but we know that the, the godly people, the righteous, will live through faith. These people are not living that way. Why? They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature so that so they have no excuse for not knowing God. So the assumption here that Paul makes is that everyone knows that there's a God. And no one's off the hook. Verse 21. Because of this. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused, claiming to be wise. They instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. And so because of this, look, look what happens. God abandons them to do whatever shameful things their heart desires. So he didn't like abandon, like, ditch them on the curb like a dog at the pound. He banned them to do what they wanted. And he's still there, okay? God's everywhere. Don't, don't, don't miss that. But he let, let's just change this here for, he let them do whatever they wanted, okay? He's not, he's not twisting your arm. He, he says, God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did violent, degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worship and serve the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise, that is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. I read this to you because you can see here in this story here, right in this text, you see a group of people and God has allowed them to do some things because they're doing what we tend to do. We tend to have faith, we say we have faith, but we tend to sidestep this faith in Christ due to these lusts that are inside of us. You know what I'm saying? Uh, hope deferred. I, I see something I like. I see something that's going to make me feel good. It's going to taste good. It's going to make me feel happy and satisfied. I want this thing. And we've got these lusts inside of us. We've got this impatience inside of us that makes us want some things, right? Want some things. So what we do is we sidestep our faith due to this, and we place our faith in something created rather than the creator, okay? Now, here's the thing. Everyone's life is going to scream something. So the question here tonight is, is your life going to scream? Acts 1-8, Jesus says that we will be his witnesses to, to Eustace, to the Golden Triangle, and to the ends of the earth. That's what he says. You can read it in the Lake County Version. Okay? That's what it says. And he says, you're going to be our witness, you're going to be our witness, your life is screaming something, so will you be a life of faith in Christ, or will you be that person that gives in to this hope deferred thing, but the, but the dream that's fulfilled, if I get it to work, then I'll be happy, then I'll be sight. What person will you be individually, what person will we be corporately? So the choice is going to be up to us, and so will we have faith in Jesus, will we be dependent upon him, will we trust in him? Will we worship him exclusively? We sidestep that just a hair and start worshiping the things that God created. We're going to talk about money, but let's just point out something before we jump into money. And is this that the things that God created they're not evil in, in of themselves? Now you see here in this text here it says in verse twenty three that they start to worship things like mere humans and birds and animals and reptiles on the ground. And so the question that I have is. It, are people and birds and reptiles and 
trees and earth and angels and governments. Oh, I still got governments. I was going to cross out demons, but I left it in there. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, governments and, and sports and affiliations and religions and money and sex and family and work and technology and science and all that. Should we respect these creations? Yes, we should. They're wonderful. They're amazing. But should we worship them by being dependent upon them and trusting in these things for our joy and fulfillment? No, absolutely not. And Jesus tells us in, in Matthew, you can't serve two masters. He never said, get rid of everything and don't enjoy anything and only have time for me. He never said that. That's not Christianity. He said, respect and enjoy my creation but worship and trust and depend in only me. He said you can't serve two masters. He didn't say you couldn't have two friends, right? He said you can only serve one master. Whatever you choose to obey, the Bible tells us, and it's obvious, you don't even need to read the Bible. We all know it. Whatever you choose to obey, it becomes your master, right? Let me ask you a question. Can you be a Democrat and Republican at the same time? That's an inner turmoil, isn't it? Can you be a Gator fan and a Seminole fan? No. That could kill a person, right? You might see two a license plate with a split down the middle. That's the first step to divorce, yo. You know what I'm saying? You can't do that because you can't serve two masters. You know what I'm saying? Like these are obvious things, but we don't even think about it. We serve two masters all the time. We serve multiple masters. So here we are tonight, we're going to talk about something that nobody really likes to talk about. It's only because it has a grip on us. I mean, honestly, it's no, it's no worse than humility, valuing other people's lives, sex, love, marriage, anything else we're going to talk about the next three, four weeks. It doesn't make any difference. It's cash because nobody likes to give it up because it's, it's our God. That's all. And he just wants to change your perspective on it. That's all. And no one's going to, we're not passing the plate around again, if that's what you're wondering. Okay? That's not going to happen. It's just a change in priority. Okay? So, so our Revelation top 10 tonight, number 7, it's, it's, it's cash. And uh, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, he says this, you cannot serve both God and money. Now, he could have come up with a lot of different things he could have said right there, right? You can't serve both God and sex. You can't serve both God and food. You can't serve God and this and this and this and this. But what did he say? He chose one thing. So do you think it's important? I'm thinking it's kind of important. If Jesus chose that one thing of everything else in the universe, he chose money as the, as the staunch competitor against God. And that's our problem. That's our problem. But listen, I want to start out by ripping into this, into money, okay? Okay, it's not like, um, you know, money is the root of all evil. It's not. That's bad theology. You can't start ripping on, you know, the rich folks and pulling out your needle and a candle cigarette trying to shove it through. See what I mean? See what I mean? It'll never happen. That's bad theology, okay? It's bad theology. Let me, let me give you a perspective on money. Okay, This is just biblical perspective, and this is coming from someone who doesn't have a lot, but this is what the Bible says about it. Okay, Let me give you some scripture verses you can read. I'm going to read it to you kind of quick. You can write down the reference, read them later. Uh, Isaiah 48, 17. Kind of, this is kind of blunt, but I love God because he's a blunt God. Uh, he says, I am the Lord God who teaches you to profit. <laughs> to the point, right? It's kind of to the point. Uh, Proverbs 10, 16. Earnings of the godly enhance their lives. Do you have a sense that money's bad in that? Earnings will enhance the life of the Christian man, the Christian woman. Uh, Proverbs 21.5, good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Is it bad? I don't think so. How about Ecclesiastes 5.19? This is a good one. This is from the guy, like, you know, Christians say, who's the smartest guy ever? Who's the richest guy ever? And guess what? I don't know. There's no gauge. No one has bank statements from Solomon to prove that, right? Uh, Bill Gates, I found out this week that he has $73 billion. So I don't even know. He may have been richer than, than Solomon. I don't know. But, you know, he's right up there, right? He's a rich dude. He's got everything y'all want. And this is what he says. In Ecclesiastes 5.19, he says, it's a good thing to receive wealth from God. Two things happen here. One, it's a good thing to receive wealth. And the second thing is, who's it coming from? Okay? So is it bad? Is it bad to have a walking load of cash? No. 
No, it's a good thing to receive it, and it comes from God. Now, Job 1.10, here's another one. This is Satan talking here, okay? He, he even recognizes, this is what he says in Job 1.10, Satan says, you, God, have made him, Job, prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. So where again, where did the wealth come from that Job was enjoying? Got it from God. So is it bad? I don't think it's bad. Most churches are either going to, they're, they're going to go off the deep end on both, okay? But let me tell you something. Jesus never demands you to throw all your money away and be poor and our church should have a dirt floor and no air conditioning and if Christians should give every single thing away at their expense, let everyone else be prosperous. It's, no. He never says that. See, there's, there's the deep end. There, there's, the, there's the poverty gospel that says that. It says that, you know what? Every, and you see it on the TV all the time. Every pastor should be broke. Oh, he's got a nice house, man. He's paying him too much. He's not driving a Buick anymore. Woo! Red flag. Every Christian should be broke. The pastor should be broke. Everyone should be broke. You should be giving it away. You shouldn't live nice. You should have nice things. No, we can have nice things, but y'all can't have nice things. That's the poverty gospel. Mm -mm. Then there's the polar opposite. The prosperity gospel that says, I'm a Christian, so I get to drive a Mercedes. <laughs> that doesn't work either. See, right there in the middle of it is called the proper gospel. Let's call it that. You know what the proper, proper gospel says? Four. You might be broke, you might be not. Deal with it. <laughs> because remember a second, what did, what did we hear a second ago? Who gives wealth? It's not up to you, is it? Who's ever worked their tail off their whole life and still have peanuts? Come on now. Yeah, right? Yeah, it's really not up to you. God decides who gets wealth. And it's a good thing. That's the proper gospel. The proper gospel is God's in charge of it. You receive what you receive, do it with joy. Okay, that's the proper gospel. Now, I'll say this, that our reputation as revolutionaries, it, it rides heavily upon where we place money. And I'm not talking about what pocket you put it in. I'm not talking about what kind of wallet you have, what kind of purse. If you're a dude, you got a fanny pack, let's make an appointment. I'll just say that. Okay, sorry, Philip. It's a sense of, yeah. Okay. But, but where we place money in our lives is very, very important. Okay, I have a question. I heard someone ask this. I don't know who it was. It was a long time ago, but it's, it's powerful. And the question is this. Actually, it's a question. Do you use people to gather more money? Or do you gather, or do you use money to gather more people? Well, what's, we're Christians, right? So what's our commission? Just kind of shout it out. What is it? Okay, go get more people, right? Summary terms, right? Just melt it on down. Go get some more people for me, Jesus said. I taught you stuff. Go share it with them. Go feed someone. Go bless them. Go pray with them. Go, whatever you do, go bring them to me, please. We're supposed to be gathering people. So are we using people in circumstances and situations and stuff to gather more money for ourselves? Are we using our resources to go gather more people for him? See, that's the reputation we're looking for because you're going to have one of them. You're going to have one of them. And, and, and look, uh, money's kind of neutral on its own. Like it comes from God. It's not good. It's not bad. It's what you do with it. It's it's what's decided. What's controlling our thoughts? What's our master? Is money a master to you? Does it, does it guide your decisions? Uh, some people think I'm crazy, and that's fine because I am. But I don't let my wife tell me what the balance is in my checking account. I haven't known my balance in a couple years now. And some people say that's not a good steward. And some people say it's irresponsible. You call whatever you want. I don't care. It's not your checkbook. Okay. I don't want to know. Let me tell you why I don't want to know. I don't want to make my choices based on how much money I have. I don't I refuse to let that bank account own me like it used to. That's my, but that, see, that's just my thing. See, I had a magic number. I had a magic number of $10,000. Anything below $10,000, I start freaking out. Like, some people have a bigger magic number, and some people have a lower magic number. So most of you, I hope, have no number. But I am guilty of that. Like, I would make decisions whether to help someone or not based on how much money I have. What does Jesus want us to do? Read 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. These people were broke. And out of their brokenness, out of their total poverty, they gave generously. So I want to be that guy. You know what I'm saying? I want to be that guy. So I just said, Meredith... I don't want to know how much we have. If, if, I'm, if, we're gonna, if I want to go spend, I'll say, hey, can I do this? And she'll just say either, or she'll say, and that's it. When we go to the bank, 
she is not allowed to say anything to me. When we're in the car, we put the money in the little chute. It shoots up, comes back. I go like this because I'm driving, right? I take the receipt with the balance and I just go like this. And I've instructed my beautiful wife to have a poker face. I don't want to know how much is in the bank because I will start making decisions based on my money god. And I don't want that. Because what will happen is if I'm below my safety net and Grayson comes in a time of great need and says, I need help, you know what I'll tell him? No. Because I know me. You might not all be that way, but I am. And so I don't want to do that. If I got it, if she gives me the, I'll give it to you. It might be my last 20, but if she, she tells me we got it, I give it. But I don't want to know, yeah, we only have 40, because then that 20 is monstrous, right? I won't give it to him. I don't want to be that guy. So I don't want to, I, I, I want Jesus to control my thoughts and actions, not my wallet. Whatever I choose to obey becomes my master, okay? So it's really, the, the issue here is, is what's controlling your thoughts and actions and, and, and your priorities, okay? And, so, and I, I kind of screamed this out a couple months ago, I think it was, but what is it that you have that God hasn't given you anyway? Right? I mean, that, that's the, you got to ask yourself, that. what do I have that God hasn't given me anyway, but yet, even though it was God that gave it to me, and now we've established that, that gut feeling that you kind of knew with the Word of God that says that all this wealth comes from God, but yet we, because we have this, this hope deferred thing going inside of our guts, we pursue wealth for wealth's sake. And we pursue wealth for stuff's sake. I mean, we're stuff. I love stuff. It's America. It's the home of the three and the stuff. We will love stuff, stuff, stuff all the time. So we pursue this thing constantly. Now, the Bible talks about this all the time. This same guy, Solomon, Ecclesiastes, the been there, done that guy who we should learn from because he's been where we want to be. And he says this in Ecclesiastes 5.10. All this pursuing, gathering wealth, this is what he says. Those who love money never have enough. Some of you raised your hands and said you worked your tail off and you still have peanuts. That's what he's saying. Okay, those who love money never have enough. And this, is, this blows my mind. He says, how meaningless, how meaningless to think money will bring happiness. The guy who had everything we want is telling you it won't do it. Change directions. Don't fall into the same hole I did. I had bazillions and I still wasn't happy. Proverbs 21, same guy, 12, 21, 26. Again, very similar verbiage. Some people are always greedy for more, but then it switches gears because it's kind of dark. Like, we're greedy, we're, we're selfish, we're trying to gather stuff, we're not healthy, we're not happy. But he changes gear right in the middle of the verse. He says, some people are always greedy for more, but, I love buts in the Bible, usually it brings good news. It says, but the godly love to give. See, the godly love to give. See, it's a total different mindset for the Christian. And that's why, like, when, I, when we got up here and took the offering a little bit ago, I just want to remind you that like that should change. It should change inside of you. Don't give out of obligation. Don't give out of guilt. Like it should become a joy to you to be able to give. Do you know what I'm saying? One of the greatest. I'm. Mean, this is. I know a lot of people say don't share with others what you've given, but there's precedence in the Bible when King David was getting ready to bring the supplies to the temple. He showed everyone in Israel how much he had brought so they could be inspired by that and they would give. So this is not praise for him. It was to try to get a job done, man. And, and so let me just tell you, one of the greatest times of the year for my wife and I is tax time because we get to write a honking check to this church. And it's awesome to be able to do it. It feels so liberating to not give a rip about money. Who would like $100 for me tonight? I'll just give it to you. Mike, I'm going to give it to you. Well, you know why? Because I don't care. It means nothing to me. It feels great to be able to give into the kingdom. It feels great to be able to give into the kingdom, to invest in other people's lives, that they might know Christ and have eternity. It feels great to do it. I encourage you to do the same. Let's jump back into the Bible. Look over at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, one of my favorite sections of Scripture. Jesus is talking. 
You know why I like him so much? He's talking for a long time. <laughs> he just goes on and on and on. But I love the subject matter, too. Go over to Matthew chapter 6. Look at verse 31. More about the same thing. Look what it says here. Jesus is talking about the gathering of stuff and working diligently. You know what happens? We, we start working so much to try to make money like somehow that's going to bring us joy fulfillment. And it just doesn't. And, and Jesus, much like the whole flying planes through our buildings and we want to kill, he's like, no, 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 no. I want you to pray. Polar, polar opposite approach to things, right? Same thing here. Don't continue to chase down money. Don't be, the, be like in, this guy in Ecclesiastes said, you, you got to know when to stop, man. you got to know when to stop, right? It's not going to help you any. So what does Jesus say here? He says, uh, don't worry about these things, what things? Say, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? We work diligently to have all this stuff, and Jesus is like, why do you even worry about this stuff? Look who, look who worries about that stuff. Remember, we're supposed to be revolutionaries, right? Different people that look and act and think differently, that think like Jesus. This is how Jesus thinks. And he's telling us, who thinks, who thinks of stuff like that? Read what it says. These thoughts dominate the mind of the non-believer. Like, if you're a believer in Christ, you shouldn't be worrying about your stuff and your money trying to pursue wealth and pursue stuff because there's this hope deferred inside of you that makes you want stuff. And so you go after it aggressively, much to the neglect of everything else that's important, especially your worship of Him. And this money becomes your God. And you forget about Jesus. That's why I said you can't serve God and your money. Because we're pursuing money so much and the acquisition of things to try to find fulfillment and purpose, and it doesn't work. I'm living proof. I'm living proof. I was freaking loaded. I had multiple houses, multiple cars, and I was totally miserable. Now I'm happy and broke. I'm happy and broke. I have purpose in my life. I have fulfillment in what I'm doing here with y'all, representing the king of kings, sharing the gospel with the world. I love this. This is more important than money. I don't give a rip about money. I don't care. I just don't care. He says, these things dominate the mind of unbelievers. And here's, here's some promises here from God, the one who spoke planets into, into existence, the one who saved you and you are trusting in him for eternity. He said, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But, there's another but. This is good news coming. You ready? But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. So seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he'll give you everything you need. You don't need to work like crazy and pursue wealth. He knows what you need. He'll give you what you need. I don't know any person ever. I love my faith. Because I don't know any person ever that's been on YouTube and said, I did this, and it's a total bust. I died. I'm dying today. I'm in my deathbed. I'm in my oxygen. I'm dying. I've given my life to Christ, and it totally sucked, and it didn't work. Find that YouTube video. It doesn't exist. Because he knows what you need. He's going to take care of it. You don't need to pursue wealth like crazy and stuff to try to find happiness. So now when we read this thing, it just sends us right back to the war in our heart. Where is your faith? Is it in God? Do you depend on Him and trust Him and worship Him alone? Or do you sidestep this Jesus fella and start worshiping, depending, and trusting in money? That's the question. I share with you several verses so far. I talk about money in the Bible, but it doesn't end. The Bible goes on and on and on, over and over, about focusing on money. Here's some more. You ready? Proverbs 23, 4. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. Don't let it own you. This flies in the face of America. Don't let money own you. Don't make decisions based on money. Base it on your faith in Christ. Base it on the word of Christ. 
not on money. I beg you. That's how we're going to be way, way different. Okay, that's how we're going to be way different. Can I give you some more? How about Proverbs 11, 28? This is a cute one. Trust in your money and down you go. How can I elaborate on that? I don't even know what else to say, okay? Jesus' warning in Matthew 6, 24 is not about, not so much money that it's bad, it's, it's about who you're serving. Who's your master? Is it God? Is it money? Is it God? Is it anything else? Is it your family? Is it your spouse? Is it your kids? Is it your career? Is it your church? Is it, what, is it your government? Is it your uh, Democrat, your Republican, North, South? What is controlling you? What is your master? So what we have to do is we have to see, okay, this is where we were, this is what we live, this is how we're doing it, and it's not right, okay? So, but a revolution is this, let's change that. Let's totally change the way we look at this thing. Let's change the way we look at money. This, just a couple of verses, okay? Really, really simple, okay? But if you put them into your life, it's going to make a massive change, okay? Proverbs 3, nine. it simply says this, honor the Lord with your wealth. Now that can mean a lot of different things. To a lot of different people, right? A lot of people will invest their wealth into certain facets of God's work here on earth. They will send their money to Africa. They will send their money to India. They will send their money here locally. They will send it for food. Some will send it for clothing and sneakers and medicine. And some will want to send their money to a, a Bible translating organization to, to send the word of God out to different places across the earth and different lands. There's all different ways you can honor the Lord with your wealth that he gave you. So it's individual. No one can tell you what you need to do with your money. But there's certain things that the Bible talks about for the Christ follower. Malachi 3.10 says, bring your tithe. Listen, we can massage scripture and make it comfortable for ourselves. Or we can be Christians and follow the word of God. Christians tithe. They give, okay? That's what they do. And you can manipulate it and step out of it if you want, but if you're going to be a Christ follower, bring your tithe to the Lord. That's what you do. And when you withhold your tithe, Malachi says you are cursed. So if things are not working well financially for you, that is because you have kept from God, which is His. What do you have that is not given from Him? Christians tithe. Now, above tithing, remember I referenced 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9? Do yourself a favor and just read both chapters in their entirety. Don't skip over it. Oh, no, if I read it, they're going to make me give. Listen, God says that out of your poverty, you should be generous in giving to help other people. That's what Christians do. That's what Christians do. Okay? Now, here's some more. Proverbs 11, 24, and 25. Um, you ever seen like a, a, a movie where there's like a, a guy comes up and he says, hey, number three in the fourth race. It's like a hot tip, right? Or, or, or you see some, uh, you ever see the movie Wall Street where you get the insider trading and you know what's going to happen and so you buy all the stock, right? Let me give you this. This is the tip of forevers. You ready? This is the tip. This isn't from, from Moose or Rocco for the horse of the third, okay? This isn't a stock. This is a tip from God. Y'all listening? Do you hear me? Don't tell everybody. Shh. Proverbs 11, 24. Give freely and become more wealthy. That's your tip. Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. These are just the words of God, they're not mine. I'm just, my, I'm just the messenger, right? I'm just bringing it to you. you got to respond. you got to respond. But he says, listen again, give freely and become more wealthy. Now listen, I want to pause there. If you're doing it to become more wealthy, you might as well go down the road, open your windows to about 60, and chuck your money out the window. Because that's what the blessing is going to be. Woo! Look at me, I'm an idiot. Right? That's your blessing. Okay. But he's telling us if we'll give freely, if our focus is on giving generously to help and give back to God what he deserves and helping to spread the kingdom of God throughout Eustace, the golden triangle, and to the ends of the earth, if you'll give to that, you become more wealthy. I'm not, I, 
I didn't write it. It's not my book. Okay? Let, let's read on. He says in verse 25, the generous, that's the mark of a Christian, of a true Christian, right? Wasn't Jesus generous? It's like he didn't have anything. But he gave himself. He gave him his own body, his own life. He spent time with people. Don't you think he just wanted to say, sometimes, how the heck with them already? I just need a break. I just want to go fishing. Don't you think, I mean, as a human, he's, he's God, he's man, but do you think those temptations ever came up? He was tempted in all ways. You know what the Bible says that? He was tempted in all ways. So he was like tempted to say, you know what? I'm sick of you. I just don't want to deal with you anymore. I want to go over here and go fishing. But what did he do? I'm going to hang out with you. Even if I don't want to. We're supposed to be generous. Okay? And so it says here, the generous, what? Will prosper. That's a promise. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Don't you want that? You stingy things? What are you holding on to? And then wondering why things just aren't so good. You will be refreshed if you refresh others. Christians with great reputations are generous people because their faith is in Jesus, the provider, rather than the provision that he gives us. So the status quo is this. Remember, the revolution is, the, is a sudden shift in the status quo. We want to get rid of this. Okay, what's, what's the status quo? What's, in the world we live in, what's, what's the common theme here? And you hear it all the time, that just money makes the world. I think it's going to throw up right here. Money makes the world go round. Like, it, it, it just melted down. Like, that's total blasphemy, right? Giving money to credit to God. God's like, do you ever do this with a basketball? That's what God's doing with the earth. Right? He's the one who started the earth spinning. He's the one who keeps it spinning. He's balancing all the stars and comets. Nothing's hitting. It's crazy. No one's hitting us. Right? He's doing all this. And we say, you know, money makes the world go round. As we buy into that stupid system, if money makes the world go round, so if we just have a little bit more money and stuff, we'll be fulfilled. Because money makes the world go round. But the revolution says something. The revolution says that we seek Jesus first, we trust Jesus continually, and we worship Jesus exclusively. That's what the revolution says. So we have to keep money in the correct spot by using it to gather souls for the king who provided the money. It's just putting it in its proper place is all. Money is not good, it is not bad. It's just putting it in its proper place. That's what we need to do. And that, that's a, I don't want to say that small adjustment makes a big difference. It's a massive adjustment because of who we are and the culture that we live in when money is very, very important. So what we have to do as revolutionaries, we can't let Satan, the CEO of the status quo, remember? He's the CEO of the status quo. We can't let him deceive you into thinking, you know, a little bit more money, a little bit more happy. A little bit more money, a little bit more freedom. The more money, more money, more money, more money. There's no freedom in that. It's constant pursuit. You're in chains because you want something that you never, ever get. And you get more and you want more and you want more and you want more. Anything in excess like that, is that freedom? No. It holds you captive. It's your master. And that's not what he wants. So what we want to do is we want to be part of the Jesus revolution and have a reputation as Jesus really does. Some people hate Jesus, but they don't really know Jesus. The ones who know Jesus, they know his reputation is one of extreme generosity and exclusive faith. Yeah, amazing faith. Like, his relationship with the Father was, was perfect in all ways, completely obedient. He wasn't relying on anything here. He put no faith in people. It was all in his dad. And that's the reputation that we should have. So, here's the thing. The question I have, and then it will be done, is this, is, is, is what are people going to talk about? What are people talking about about you? Kelly, Wendy, Amy, anyone, Kyle, Jamie, Tim? What are they talking about? Like, it shouldn't keep you up at night, but it should make you think. I mean, stupid people are really good judges. You ever see someone who's like, um, <laughs> Joey had some, some dude hit on him. He was telling everybody about it, right? I said, hey, it's still a compliment, right? <laughs> right? Hey, people 
people are good judges, right? They're going to know. Right? I think the guy's crazy, but you know what happened. They're going to they're gonna say something about you. What are people thinking about you? What are they thinking about you individually? What are they thinking about us? So we got a new name. Like all of our mistakes in the past, we can wash them away. We got a new name. We dodged that bullet. Let's start afresh. What do people think about Revolution Church? Will they be a people that people across Eustace, the Golden Triangle, and to the ends of the earth, will they be talking about our faith? Will they be talking about our trust in Him, our dependence upon Him, our service unto Him, our worship under and up to Him? Will they be talking about that? Oh, our this, 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 this. This thing inside of us, this hope deferred, will drive us to sidestep Jesus and put our faith in something that he's given us? Or will our faith stay strict and set our face like stone and keep focused upon him? That's the question. So we got this broken world with all this broken population and people are hurting and suffering and they all want to better their life. Except for the moron out there once in a while. But everyone wants to better their life. And they're trying to throw money at it, throw booze at it, throw drugs at it, throw career at it, throw government at it, throw sex at it, throw money at it all the time. And it's just not working. So will people be able to look at us here at Revolution Church and go, you know what? They got it figured out. I want what they got. Grace, and tell me what it is that I don't know. Why are you freaking smiling all the time, bro? So that's the thing. Will people be talking about our faith in Him? Or will they be talking about that we were greedy, self-centered? You know, I don't want to go down that road as we close. I don't want to do that. I want to be positive. I want to have some light. Will people talk about our great faith in Him? That's my challenge. So the question, the last question is this. It's simple. Do we have a revolution reputation? Let's pray. I want to take communion together. The gentleman, going to pass it out for us. And we'll take communion together. Uh, Father, I thank you for letting us gather here tonight. I thank you for this clear word. Lord, I just pray right now that you would help us all uh, to be uh, to be revolutionaries. You know, you, you started something 2,000 years ago. You said, listen, folks, you're doing it wrong. Let me show you how to do this thing. Focus on me. Fix your eyes upon me, and I will show you the way. Psalm 32, I was reading it today and yesterday. It just said that he will guide us down the correct path, the best path for our life. That's your promise, Lord. So help us to, to, to live under this word tonight, to be different, Lord, to put money in its right place. And Lord, if there's anything in our life that's keeping us from genuine faith and worship and dependence and trust and love exclusively on you, just show that to us so we can make a change, so we can repent of that thing and begin to follow you down the best path for our life. I thank you for this, Lord. I thank you for all these people here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Embrace his grace. That's the word for the day. We're going to play a video in just a moment um, while the guys are passing out. Uh, I don't want to play the video while we're passing out the communion because I want you to be able to see this and not be able to look around. And then we'll take you together after the video. Uh, but while they're doing that, with this revolution, this new name, uh, Tuesday night uh, at our men's group, uh, Wayne and Nina uh, blessed us with having the men over uh, on the flyer and had some pizza and shared some laughs and got stuck in a mud hole, somebody did, I can't remember who that was. Where'd you go, Dad? I wasn't going to call out. So one person got stuck, then another person got stuck, and then another person had to go get them. It was, you know, like three students. So. But it was, uh, it was, I, I posted something about, you know, you, you rely on each other. Okay, you rely on your brothers and sisters to help each other out. And so there was a reason that, you know, there was guys with big trucks there. Okay? There was a reason that, you know, Mark grabbed a 4x4 four four from the dealership and... Can I touch on that real quick? Uh, I was not going to grab that truck. <laughs> I was going to take a different vehicle and I said, ah, That's the crazy part about it. Yeah. That's the crazy part about it. This way, Jared didn't have to travel, you know, back to uh, his in-laws or whatnot, you know, via a truck. So, but.
it just was it was interesting how the night played out. I don't know if a lot of people realize this, but the men in this church, um, we have about 70, 80, 100 people in this church. When we started this, uh, our 33 series, we had like 30, 35 men. And uh, I think we averaged about 20, 25 men on Tuesday nights. Um, the church I went to before, um, you get men's groups and you might have five, six, seven. And you're talking three, four hundred people in the church. So it's very impressive. The men in this church are making a big difference. They are developing some uh, some very uh, close friendships. Uh, stuff that just is, is becoming very real. It's changing some lives. We've seen it firsthand. Changing some lives big time. So, um, let's watch this video, okay, and then we'll take communion. Thank <laughs> you. 
guys can stand if you want to. 